In this video, I'm going to show you how to solve the angular momentum eigenvalue relations for the orbital angular momentum eigenfunctions. So if you're interested in seeing how to do this and you want more details on the nature of the problem generally, then keep watching. Let's get going with deriving the orbital angular momentum eigenfunctions. From working with the angular momentum operator algebra, we know that the angular momentum eigenstates satisfy these relations. If you aren't familiar with these results, then you can take a look at the link in the description to a previous video on this topic. In that video, I showed that these results are true for the general case using an abstract, nonspecific solution of the angular momentum operator algebra based on quantum harmonic oscillator raising and lowering operators. These relations are therefore naturally true for orbital angular momentum given by this formula, where all observables are operators satisfying the appropriate commutation relations because this is quantum mechanics. The aim of this video is to use these orbital angular momentum operators and the pre-derived eigenvalue relations to compute the complete spectrum of position basis angular momentum eigenfunctions. When deriving the angular momentum eigenvalue relations with the abstract nonspecific quantum harmonic oscillator based angular momentum operators, we found the range of L and M are given by these relations. You may have heard that half integers aren't allowed. This is true for orbital angular momentum. However, the QHO solution of the angular momentum operator algebra is not specific to orbital angular momentum. It is completely non-specific, and as a result, we got all the numbers that these values could possibly be in the context of any concept of angular momentum, not just what they can be for orbital angular momentum. When one writes out a concrete representation of orbital angular momentum operators, usually the position representation, and solves the resulting partial differential equations for the orbital angular momentum eigenstates, one finds that the complete set of them only consists of states corresponding to integer L and M. This, as I said at the beginning, is what we're going to do. We're going to calculate these orbital angular momentum eigenfunctions. In case you were wondering, the half integers come into play with spin angular momentum for fermions, which have half integer spin. In that case, the relevant solution of the angular momentum operator algebra is a set of matrices with eigenvalues of the form given by the general eigenvalue relations, but where L and M take on half integer values. The path we will take to derive the position basis orbital angular momentum eigenfunctions is the following. Experience has shown that solving this problem is by far easiest to accomplish in spherical coordinates, so the first thing we will do is rewrite the standard XYZ linear momentum operator in spherical coordinates. We will then insert these into the angular momentum formulas along with the formulas for the position operators in spherical coordinates. This will give us the usual XYZ component angular momentum operators in spherical coordinates. We can then plug these into the eigenvalue relations to produce a pair of partial differential equations that are satisfied by the position basis angular momentum eigenfunctions. The last step is then to solve these partial differential equations for the eigenfunctions themselves. This ends up being a completely exactly solvable problem. The familiar Cartesian component linear momentum operators are given here. The goal is not to try and change to spherical coordinate momentum operator components. We merely want to express the Cartesian ones in spherical coordinates. This can be done with the chain rule. Spherical coordinates are defined like this, and the inverse relations like this. The inverse relations will be most immediately useful in the chain rule. Then once we're taking the derivatives, we can use these forward relations in order to express the whole thing in terms of spherical coordinates. Let's start with d over dx first. Using the chain rule to write it out, we get this formula, and we see in that what derivatives we need to take of the various spherical coordinates here with respect to the Cartesian ones. We can plug in the spherical coordinate formulas expressed in Cartesian coordinates like this, take the derivatives, then plug in the formulas for the x, y, and z in terms of spherical coordinates and simplify down, and ultimately we get to here. The process is very similar for y and z. I will show you the algebra written out for both of those so you can check your results. This is the result we get for dy, and then finally dz ends up being a little simpler because this thing doesn't depend on z, so a term drops out and it simplifies down to that. 
To summarize our results, we have these three values for the Cartesian partial derivatives in terms of the spherical coordinates and partial derivatives with respect to the spherical coordinates. We can then plug these into the linear momentum operators to get them expressed in spherical coordinates. They end up being this. Then we can look back at the formulas we had for the components of the angular momentum in the introduction and start plugging these momentum operators and the spherical coordinate formulas for these x, y, and z values into here to get the angular momentum component operators in the spherical coordinates. It's pretty straightforward. Plugging in Simplifying gets us to this one for Lx. A very similar bit of algebra gets us to Ly. And a very similar bit of algebra gets us to Lz. Except for Lz, we see that a lot more simplification happens with the trig functions, and we're just left with a derivative, which is really cool. And it means that Lz is especially simple in spherical coordinates, which is why usually angular momentum eigenstates are selected to be eigenstates of the angular momentum squared and LZ instead of another component of the angular momentum, which would be valid, but LZ is simplest in the standard spherical coordinates where this problem is easiest to solve. So that's why it's usually selected. Here's a summary of our results. With the angular momentum components computed, we therefore have LZ computed, which is one of the operators that we need in order to solve out the eigenvalue relations for the orbital angular momentum eigenstates. Now, I'm using eigenstates and eigenfunctions somewhat interchangeably. You only get eigenfunction representations of eigenstates when you pick a basis and can express them concretely. But strictly speaking, eigenfunctions are a representation of the eigenstates, so you could still call them eigenstates. We, however, still need L squared. This will be computed next with the various component operators we have just finished calculating. Using a test function helps here because a lot of times we're going to need to apply a product rule where we've got some trig functions multiplying a derivative of something. And it can be easy to forget to use the product rule if you don't have a function in here, which you know depends on the variable you're differentiating with respect to. Directly plugging in these components gives us this result. And then I multiplied it out like this. After multiplying this out, I noticed that these two terms canceled with each other and that some factoring could be done to reveal something that can be set equal to 1 with the Pythagorean identities. Doing that gets us to this. Now we can use the product rule on this term and this term. And of course, that generates four terms. Two of those terms turn into this one, which simplifies down due to the same Pythagorean identity we used earlier. And two of them cancel with each other, simplifying things down to this. Then we can use the Pythagorean identity on this term and this term, which again generates four terms, one of which can be simplified down with the same Pythagorean identity. And of course, we have another cancellation, which gets us down to this right here. And we can use a different Pythagorean identity to convert this into a cosecant squared, which is just 1 over cosine squared. And we can also rewrite these two terms as this term right here. And if you bother to use the product rule here, you'll see that this actually turns into two terms, specifically these two. So they're equivalent. And that gives us this value for L squared. It's a nice, simple result for the angular momentum squared. It's really cool. Now we can apply this to solving the problem. In the introduction, I gave the eigenvalue relations that the orbital angular momentum eigenfunctions satisfy. Now, strictly speaking, in that case, I just had the ket vectors, so I was dealing with abstract states. But you can easily pick a specific representation, in this case, the position representation. And then you're dealing with eigenfunctions, as I was talking about a little bit ago. Now that we have directly usable expressions for the relevant angular momentum operators, we can write out the explicit partial differential equations that we need to solve for them from those eigenvalue relations, specifically by inserting these partial derivative formulas for the various relevant angular momentum operators into those eigenvalue relations. Doing that gives us these partial differential equations. The first thing that one might notice about these equations is that the first one, the only one involving more than one variable, is separable. The second thing that one might notice is that when separating variables on the first equation, one must select a separation constant to be m squared for the second relation to be satisfied. Basically, when we separate this out, we get an equation for the phi factor that's solved by phases. And in order for those phases to also satisfy this relation, the coefficient in the exponential needs to be m. And that's basically all I'm saying there. 
Separating variables proceeds pretty normally. We first plug in this on sots and divide to get this. Then I eliminated the h bar squared factor, subtracted this to the other side, and then eliminated a minus sign, which got me here. Then we can subtract this to the other side and we can set it equal to a separation constant because now we've got separated variables. From here we can see that the azimuthal equation is this and we immediately recognize that the complete set of orthogonal continuous solutions are just phases where continuity stipulates that m is an integer. This is where the ban on half integers comes from for m within the context of orbital angular momentum eigenfunctions. We will see the same restriction on l when we handle the theta equation. We will also see the familiar l-based range restriction on m. This one manifests itself in the nature of the theta equation solutions. This is the theta equation. This equation is extremely well known in mathematics and has been exhaustively studied. From this it is known that the subset of solutions to this equation that are non-singular and therefore normalizable are the associated Legendre polynomials with argument cosine theta. Associated Legendre polynomials are a subset of associated Legendre functions of the first kind for L is a non-negative integer and and m is an integer. So we have that the theta solution is proportional to these associated Legendre polynomials, where we have this formula for them, and then this other formula for them for negative m, where these are the Legendre polynomials referenced by this formula. One can see from these formulas that the wave function goes to zero unless m is an integer between negative l and l, or equal to one of them. That's how this restriction comes about in the context of orbital angular momentum eigenfunctions. So the complete solution is this. These functions that turned out to be the angular momentum eigenfunctions are called spherical harmonics, and we can see, given this part, that this does in fact satisfy by that second eigenvalue relation. This one, that we specifically select the separation constant in the first one to be m in order to ensure that it would be satisfied. We also know that this set of functions is orthogonal for different quantum numbers, and this set of functions is orthogonal for different quantum numbers. So we have this result, and this is important because angular momentum eigenstates are supposed to be orthogonal, and this ensures that they are. They're a complete orthogonal set. We have now figured out what the orbital angular momentum eigenfunctions are up to a constant. There is, however, one last thing that needs to be done, and that is normalization. Quantum systems whose energy eigenstates are also orbital angular momentum eigenstates show up all the time. In those situations, the orbital angular momentum eigenfunctions end up being the angular part of the wave function, or even the entire wave function, depending on the situation. In these applications, we need normalized angular momentum eigenfunctions as part of our effort to have a normalized wave function. Systems that are partly or completely solved by angular momentum eigenfunctions include the quantum quantum rigid rotor, which is completely solved by them, and the hydrogen atom, where the angular part of the wave function is the spherical harmonics. We can replace the proportionality sign in the orthogonality condition with an equal sign to obtain the normalization condition, which is this. One can look up the relevant general integrals of associated Legendre functions of cosine theta and the phases, which make the azimuthal part, in a table or use Mathematica. Regardless, we obtain this answer for that integral in general. This means that in order for them to be normalized, we must set a equal to this value, where epsilon is a convention used in quantum mechanics, thus the normalized spherical harmonics, and therefore the complete normalized angular momentum eigenfunctions are these. We have succeeded in achieving our goal. So now you know how to solve the angular momentum eigenvalue relations for the orbital angular momentum eigenfunctions. If somebody ever asks you whether or not you know how to do that and you say no, you are now lying. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Dietrich out.